Marcy Hyman with SAE International. I want to welcome you to SAE Live and thank you for making the time to join us today. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Grayson Brulte, innovation strategist and the host of today's conversation and also the host of the SAE Tomorrow Today podcast. Take it away, Grayson. Thank you so much, Marcy, for um, laying all the groundwork for the, our wonderful conversation today. I'm delighted to be here today to host SAE Live to continue SAE's mission of expanding learning by bringing individuals together from diverse backgrounds for unique and insightful conversations. Today, I'm very proud and honored to have Mike Stankert, Managing Director, Automotive Practice Aon, and Jillian Slyfield, Managing Director, Digital Economy Practice Leader at Aon, to join us for this wonderful conversation. Mike, Jillian, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Mike, to kick off SAE Live with Aon, will you please kindly share with the audience a high-level overview of Aon and how Aon works with the automotive and autonomous vehicle industries? Sure, be happy to. Um, thanks again for having us uh, today. Um, so for those that aren't uh, familiar with Aon, we're um, a large publicly traded uh, insurance brokerage firm with representation um, around the globe. And uh, we bring you know, professional advice and insurance solutions across really three main pillars. There's uh, risk, health, and retirement. Uh, and our 50,000 employees that we've got, again, spread throughout the world, each of those are a specialist in one of those three areas. And then within each of those camps of, of expertise, there's hundreds of subject matter experts across, you know, a wide variety of risk, of risk areas. Um, cutting across that infrastructure, expertise, and, and physical infrastructure, we've got industry practices, and uh, probably uh, 15 to 20 different industry practices that tailor all of those um, solution sets to specific industries and, and, delivering, and delivering those with, um, not, you know, daily knowledge um, and fresh insights around where that in, where each industry is and, and where they're going. Um, so I've spent uh, the last couple decades of my career working with one of those industry practices in, in automotive. Uh, got me here uh, to Detroit about 25 years ago and, and have uh, set up camp here and working with um, the global automotive industry um, again for the last few decades. Um, I've spent, you know, most of my time working on traditional risks uh, in the industry, very challenging industry uh, related to, for example, product liability, global supply chains, protecting property, you know, plants and equipment, um, mergers and acquisitions and um, risks like that, um, and was quite challenged for that uh, up till uh, five years ago when, when the industry really started to change and the subjects of uh, subject matter of autonomous vehicles and mobility uh, showed up on the on the screen, and um, we've we've dug deep into um, those emerging risks and have been working uh, again across those traditional automotive companies, the household name uh, brands that we're all aware of, and those key suppliers, plus a lot of new. Um, tech companies and new capital that's come into the industry that's been focusing on the new areas of risk um, and mobility and autonomy. And that's where Jillian and I um, have uh, intersected and thought it was certainly best to start working together where, where her industries and mine overlap. So Jillian, there's a segue to your introduction. Yeah, great. Well, thanks, Mike. Um, oh, Mike has said it best. I think you've got a great introduction to the way that Aon works, but the piece that I think differentiates us in the uh, autonomous vehicle space is, you know, autonomous vehicles are not only an emerging technology, but one that looks across a lot of different risk issues in a way that many other business models don't. And so what Mike and I are really proud to have done is pulled together a strong group of people from across the firm representing different areas like um, cyber liability. Of course, this impacts both data privacy and other kinds of privacy issues. We look at things like general liability and that impact with autonomous vehicles, as well as auto liability. So where those might be segregated in other kinds of policies that are protecting different types of clients, in the autonomous vehicle space, it's imperative that we're all working together across that spectrum um, to bring a, a holistic solution to these clients. So it's really an exciting space for us in insurance. Um, it's always fun to work and build on something that's new 
um, and we're proud to represent Aeon in the space. And the fun thing is, is Jillian, you're based in San Francisco and in, in the heart of technology. Mike, you're based in Detroit, uh, the heart of the automotive world, and you're bringing them all together. And Jillian brought up a really good point about risk. So you're taking your automotive background, Jillian's incredible background in, in technology. So the, I have to ask you, how do you ensure an autonomous vehicle when the first person approaches it? Okay, we're going to build this vehicle. It's going to drive itself and we need insurance. How do you insure it? Do you want to start with that, Mike? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Then, you know, as I was prepping for that, certainly we knew that question was coming, uh, <laughs> uh, given the theme of this conference. And, you know, the most simple question can uh, really be one of the most challenging ones to explain. Um, Cause historically, um, insurance for a vehicle was really focused on the behavior of the driver and, and one of the main underwriting uh, features or, or underwriting criteria is, is who's driving that vehicle and what's their record and are they paying attention and all that. So throw that out the window and, and, uh, and start from scratch. But um, so what we, um, the way we approach you know, that simple question of how do you insure vehicles, first of all, as Jillian alluded to, you have to understand you know, first of all, who we're representing. And in the broader picture here, we're trying to represent the entire ecosystem of autonomy. Um, and that includes the, um, the people, uh, the companies that are developing the full vehicles, the companies that are developing the AV, the AV technologies, the other components like LIDAR, the base vehicle itself, um, as well as uh, companies that will be using the vehicles after they're, you know, optimized and, and sold. So uh, the vehicle, so it, it depends greatly on who's actually uh, going to be our client and, and what they're going to be using the vehicle for. Um, so that, you know, that opens up another um, branch of the tree when you, when you start thinking about how these vehicles are going to be used. Initially, everybody's using them now just to test for them, but ultimately, uh, comes down to are there going to be people, you know, is this going to be a people business? Is it going to be a ride hailing business that's going to house, uh, that's going to be uh, using the vehicles? Is it going to be community shuttle services, you know, again, um, t carrying people around? Is it going to be a trucking company, you, you know, shipping cargo or goods? Um, um, so those are, you know, those are two big areas that have hugely different uh, risk profiles. And that'll weigh into the question of how we how we insure it. The next step really is looking at who's who's actually built the vehicle and who's contributed the technology to the vehicle. Are we representing one of those companies? That adds a whole dimension of product liability um, for those that that are um, manufacturing the vehicles. And they could be the owner of the vehicle. They could be the creator of the vehicle, and they could also be the company that's deploying it in the field. Um, so that adds another one. And then lastly is uh, where is it going to be operated? You know, what are the state regulations around that that, that kind of weigh into um, um, how much insurance they need um, and, and any other kind of contractual requirements that are put on our clients? So, so that's just half of the equation is kind of understanding the exposure. And then the other half is who's going to be the counterparty? Uh, what insurance company um, is comfortable with this risk. And um, we've spent quite a bit of time, um, you know, again, beginning in 2015, for me, kind of starting to answer that question. Um, there's plenty of insurance companies, dozens and dozens that are, that over the last, you know, 100 years have gotten very comfortable with automotive, automobile liability insurance or motor insurance, as it's called in, in Europe. Um, but when you take the driver out and then ask the same question, um, that's, that's a whole different story. And so we've been working with the insurance industry to um, get them acclimated and warmed up to this new risk. Um, and it's, um, I, I guess my, you know, I'll, I'll finish and, and let Jillian um, add in here. But uh, right now I'm very, I'm very comfortable and confident that the insurance market is adapting quite well to being able to say, yes, we'll insure an autonomous vehicle. Yeah, Jillian, think, you want to add in? 
Yeah, sure do. I think these are all risk issues that the insurance industry is used to. They're just not used to putting them together in this format. So the puzzle looks a little different when it's put together here. But we understand auto risk. We understand general liability. We understand cyber liability. Now we've got to figure out, to Mike's point, you know, what is the makeup of the exposure that we're trying to cover in any one um, period? And who is our client from a, from a broker perspective? We're trying to look at that. One of the things that's been very interesting and, and challenging in this space is that for a broker like Aon, we might have multiple clients who are coming together in one transaction. So as an example, um, we may have a client who's an OEM. We might also have separate, a client who is um, a manufacturer of some or all of the parts of the vehicle manufacturing for the um, autonomous vehicle pieces. Um, we also might have the TNC or the rideshare company where the vehicle is going to be in use as a client. And so sometimes the same carriers, insurance companies, are looking across all of those risks, and they may not want to represent each of the companies in all of that transaction because there's um, too much risk when it's stacked upon each other. So one of the challenges that we're looking at is um, when you have a limited number of insurance companies who are comfortable in this space, um, they may want to be careful with how much capacity they deploy across any one transaction, and that transaction may include um, multiple clients, if you will, or mul multiple companies that we're trying to have insured. So it's really interesting to see how this piece fits together. I know in, in my space, which is mobility, and for us, um, autonomous vehicles absolutely fits in mobility, but we're also looking at kind of ride share and car share, um, platform enabled delivery. And those are the use cases, if you will, oftentimes for the autonomous vehicles. And so we also have to say, how does that um, affect the insurance and, and the contract? What I, what I understand very clearly in mobility is when each one of us as patrons utilizes one of those platforms, there's an expectation that insurance is included as part of the transaction. And that's different than in other types of transactions. In, in other um, insurable environments and other places of exposure, we expect um, to either purchase insurance, if you think of like a rental car situation where you're asked to buy insurance at the point of transaction, um, we don't necessarily assume that. But in mobility, the users are assuming that insurance is there. So we as a community in the insurance broking world need to make sure that appropriate is insurance is there not only to cover the enterprise proper, but also the point of transaction participants. Those are some really interesting points and I, I, I've been dying to know this. And so I have to kind of put you on the spot and ask instead of the, on, the, on the risk thing. Are there any mobility products that are uninsurable today? Oh, that's a loaded question, Grayson. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it. <laughs> I'll say no, it's not uninsurable. What, what we have to do when looking at challenging risk issues is hit on all the points that Mike was just talking about. Like what is the use case? Who are the participants? Let's fully understand what the exposure is. And then one of the things I walk our clients through um, is looking at if you're, if, if I think of any point of transaction, autonomous vehicles is a great example. We don't have 10 years of lost data or 10 years of exposure information for an autonomous vehicle company. We can't give that to a carrier. And in other circumstances, in legacy types of business, that's something they would ask for and, and should expect to receive. But what we do have is what I call deep data. So I, I always say we don't have the long data, but we do have deep data, which means we have a lot of information about any point of transaction. And so part of our job as a broker, and we are in partnership with our clients and our carriers, is to provide as much information as we can about each point of transaction so that the underwriter can properly create pricing that makes sense for that transaction. Um, maybe utilizing data that's very unique and different than that what they would have utilized in a different kind of, if you will, um, legacy or kind of normal auto liability situation. So I think first we have to start with um, what kind of data are we using? What can we offer to the underwriting community that would help them get cover comfortable with the risk or understand the risk? Um, is there analogous data that might not be exactly on, but we can use that as a guide when creating insurance products? So I think that's really important. Um, and then creating flexible policies. I mean, whenever we have an emerging um, type of business, we have to kind of break the mold and say, you know, it used to be, and most still are, that auto, um, uh, insurance policies are 12 months, as an example. But for the most part, that's not the law. That's just 
what we've done is normal. Um, and so in certain cases where we've broke policies for emerging business units in um, auto and mobility, one of the things that we've done is created insurance policies that are flexible throughout the year in different dynamics. So those dynamics might be growth of the business. Those dynamics might be um, risk elements, claims activity and loss ratio um, and things like that. So we're looking at all of those pieces. Um, and then the other, the other side of it is we might just need to use different types of tools that are available in the insurance industry earlier in the life cycle. So I'll give you an example. It might just be with a legacy client that they weren't thinking about captives or self-insurance until far into the life cycle of the business. It might be 10 years, 15 years, much longer, sometimes never. Um, with these types of businesses and particularly in our mobility clients, what we're finding is that um, they're looking at, at tools like captives, like risk retention groups, different types of flexible insurance programs that allow them more control over the product, um, uh, product being the insurance solution earlier in their life cycle. It might be in year two or year three of their business, which is a very unique way of thinking about it. So you think of a business model that's very young using a very sophisticated risk solution. And so there's this kind of interesting blend there that we need to balance. Mike, we, we got a yeah, really think, great question. Oh, go ahead. Okay. No, I was just going to add in that um, speaking on the autonomous vehicle side, you know, the your, your original question was, are any of these risks uninsurable? And uh, the, the answer, in my from my perspective, is not necessarily by the traditional insurance products that have been out there for the last few decades. And Jillian um, hit on that with the you know the topic of flexible insurance. And that, um, you know, with autonomy, depending on the, the use case, you know, you could have a scenario where a, a new business is created their own vehicle. So they're a vehicle manufacturer and they're not going to sell it to anybody. They're going to they're going to deploy it themselves in a, in a ride hailing business. And the vehicle itself is is a, you know, a mobile computer that's susceptible to um, cyber risks, for example, that, that didn't exist before. And if you were going to start, if you were starting from scratch to insure that business, you wouldn't necessarily pick off the shelf the insurance policies that have been designed uh, for the past, which are each of those risks, ownership of a vehicle and manufacture of a vehicle and protecting a vehicle from cyber hacking. Those are all insured in different places in the insurance community. If you're starting up from scratch, which is what we're looking at, is you might want to blend all those together and develop a, uh, an integrated policy that covers them all because they, the risks are harder to um, um, differentiate in the event of an accident. You could have all three of those individual components contributing to an accident. So that's, uh, that's been a challenge um, for us. Mike, we have a great question uh, for Mary M. When, you're, when you are approached by a, a company that says, we're going to start in the United States, but then we're going to scale into Europe or other parts of the world, how does the insurance work? And what are, what are those risks that are exposed in that? If they, you know that they have it based on their balance sheet and who they are, that they can scale globally. How does that affect their insurance? Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it, uh, um, it's... Uh, you know, I think we, we, we solve for that problem on a daily basis, regardless, re, regardless of whether the risk is autonomous vehicles or mobility. We've got, you know, obviously many of our, most of our clients are, are globally scaled. Um, but when it comes to um, automobile liability insurance, which is, in, in, from one perspective, a very simple insurance, uh, when you look at it globally, it, it, it's complicated. Every country has their uh, different rules, and regulations around it. They call it different things, like they call it motor insurance over there, and we don't call it that here. And in some countries like the UK, the, it's an it's a unlimited liability. Um, you, you can't cap it, for example. Um, and so there's lots of regulation and lots of complexity that we get very good at in understanding and um, and then those are the kind of things that our clients, you know, rely on us uh, to understand that, and um, and then we um, we tailor it to how each company is operating. In some cases, we build a program for each region or country of the world and have that be um, an independent program, or we try to link them all back into a global program. 
that uh, is with a common insurer so that we can um, execute the program consistently and, you know, as Jillian brought up earlier, um, capture data on a uniform basis so that we're learning about how that fleet is performing around the world kind of in a consistent basis. I would add one, one other thing that's been very helpful to us is, you know, as a global firm, there's people like Mike and like me um, all over the world. So we've got uh, similar individuals with similar skill sets in Europe, uh, Asia, Latin America. And with that skill set, you know, oftentimes, I, I, literally daily, I'm calling someone in another country and saying, um, auto is incredibly regulated, one of the most highly regulated um, coverages in the world. And, and that's true pretty much every country. And so, you know, what works in the United States isn't necessarily what's going to work in China or Ukraine or Argentina. So we've got to be really um, adaptive to what's what the, the um, foreign local requirements are. Um, and the way we build policies uh, might be different too. So as an example, um, we use usage-based insurance here, meaning one of the kind of adaptations over the last five or six years in insurance um, for automotive related exposures is to base the insurance pricing on a per unit basis. So it might be a per minute, it might be per mile and, um, or per transaction, depending on what your transaction is. That's legal here and we can do that in, in many cases. That's not necessarily true in other places. So we've gotta be really thoughtful in the way that we build the policies and, and design them. Um, but I think if you're taking a global approach and we have an understanding of the strategy of the business that we're trying to ensure, then we can say, okay, we can still accomplish those same objectives um, and cover off all the regulatory and legal needs in country. Um, it just might happen a little differently in each geography and we've gotta, be, we've gotta account for that. Um, one of the things that we do on my team for our clients, because all of our clients are emerging risk and about 75% of them are mobility related, is um, we have an insurance review that we do in each country per type of business. And it just gives our clients a view to what they're gonna have to think about when they enter a new country and say, I'm going to have autonomous vehicles in um, Spain, let's say, um, what do I need to be thinking about? And so we put together, here's the carriers, insurance companies that might be relevant for you. Here's the considerations, here's the regulatory guidelines that kind of go through that. So they've got a roadmap, it doesn't answer every question, but it gives them a sense of, Here's what I'm gonna to have to think about and put that in as part of my launch plan there. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll just add one more in, you know, for traditional risks, um, those, you know, country by country requirements and regulations have been pretty well established. And, you know, we've got teams that, that, that know that um, automatically. When it comes to emerging um, businesses and risks like mobility and, and autonomy, you have to pretty much go back about every six months and ask the questions over again. There's so, it's so dynamic right now that uh, many countries um, haven't established, you know, firm um, regulation and, and ruling, even us. I mean, look at our, our uh, NHTSA has yet to put out, you know, formal, you know, uh, sanctioned formal laws and regulations. They're still just working on, you know, guidance, if, if you will, on that. So, um, it's a continuous process right now for, for the, this family of risks. And as companies are scaling globally, you work hand in hand with the risk manager and the policy teams to lay the groundwork as they get ready to uh, deploy in a foreign country. Is that a fair uh, assumption? It, it, it's fair, that's a fair assumption. I think depending on um, what the client's needs are, it, we have some clients that are very their request of us is very prescriptive where they say, can you just make sure that I'm covered here and that I've got what I need under X, Y, and Z circumstances. And we can do that for them. We have other clients who come to us and say, we want to work hand in glove with you to create something that's bespoke. We may have a hundred people on our risk team and we're ready to be an engaged partner in that. So it depends on the sophistication of the client and the way that they you know, whether they want to outsource some of that, whether they keep it internal, but it's definitely a partnership. This is, this is not a situation where you go into the marketplace, take a submission and get five insurance companies responding back and negotiate them and whatever, like we might do with legacy products. This is where you, you start with um, broader conversations about strategy and risk. And as you narrow it down over that short period of marketing time, you land with a partner in a carrier who understands exactly what the risk issues are of the client you're trying to, the, the autonomous vehicle, 
business mm -hmm. and then you land on a product that fits them. So it's a very um, different and collaborative process for selling on an insurance policy. Sure. Yeah, and, and then I'll, I'll add on the insurer side, um, you know, there's a limited number. I think there's ample and uh, number of insurers um, today that can handle a global program and, and have built out their infrastructure and get regulated and, and licensed in, in, um, in the countries around the world. But there's not like there's 25 or 50 of them or anything. There's, you know, there's a, um, I would say maybe 10 at best uh, that could handle a global program and that might even be a stretch. So, so that's always, a, you know, that, that's been a challenge, but it's um, the insurance industry is kind of shaped around um, over time um, satisfying um, the needs for global programs. So it's become more of the norm. Mike, we have a, a great question from a, a great individual, Cameron Gita from Autonomous Stuff. He says, what about risk associated with hybrid autonomous systems, like a class A truck that is only autonomous when on the freeway, but a driver is still sitting in the seat the entire time? This seems like the fastest growing market for public road autonomy in the US right now. Does the buck stop with the driver? Oh, that's yeah. That, that that's a great question. Yeah, the the um, I, I don't think so. You know, that I think the uh, it kind of gets back to who are we insuring there? And um, in the case of, um, uh, I think an underwriter would like that kind of, especially from twenty twenty to twenty twenty five, um, that we would expect that autonomy and human driving are going to overlap substantially, maybe even within the same vehicle. So um, solving for the first and last mile is, you know, is a big issue in, in, um, in the trucking industry. From the insurance perspective of it, I think they like the idea that there is a, a, a driver there that will take the vehicle on that first and last mile and let, and let the computer run it uh, through, through the middle. So, um, in that case, I would, you know, the business itself that owns the truck, they're the ones where the buck stops and, and, and they're insurer. Um, um, but, uh, um, you know, that, that's where it gets uh, complicated with, with in the, um, the ecosystem, you know, the, the autonomous vehicle ecosystem. There's so many different participants that are on that truck. There could be the LIDAR manufacturer. There could be the, the, uh, the, the autonomous system that was either developed by um, the, the trucking company themselves, it might have been developed by the, the company that manufactured the truck, or it could have been purchased independently from um, one of the companies that we're working with today that are just developing AV systems and selling it to people. And if that fails, then um, when it goes to uh, determining um, who's at fault, it's going to depend a lot around the situation, but um, I think a lot of eyes are going to be looked to the AV develop, development, uh, the AV system to determine um, what happened and, um, and what went wrong. The good news about that, though, is, and again, that we'll come, I think we'll revisit the topic of, of data and how um, vital that is in insurance, is that when there is an accident, we're going to have um, great data to determine exactly what happened, um, including cameras and everything that, that will surround the, the, the crash scene. And I think that we're going to have a lot of certainty around what happened in cases and, and who's responsible, uh, what component part or whether it was uh, another, another vehicle that would cause the accident or not. I think that that's going to be very healthy for the insurance industry to have um, that data. And that's a great thing. And I'm going to pull up our first poll here uh, for our audience. And the, the, the poll asks, who owns the data collected during an autonomous vehicle ride? So we'll let the uh, attendees um, answer that uh, question here. And we're getting, I mean, we're probably over a dozen to almost two dozen uh, questions around the same line. So I'd like to uh, ask this from Frederick C. And thank you so much for bringing up this question. If autonomous vehicles achieve extraordinary approved levels of vehicle safety, how is the insurance industry affected both in terms of premium and size? Jillian, Mike, which one would you would like to take that one? I, I don't mind starting, and I know, Mike, you've got a robust answer for this too, because we <laughs> think about this a lot. Um, but I think that the very 
short and quick answer is um, we believe that the pie shrinks overall if you're thinking about premium. If you're adding any kind of safety, and it, it sounds like from the question you're talking about pervasive safety, that we've got autonomous vehicles um, relevant across you know, the bulk of a geography, if you will, and in that um, you've got a safer driving environment, the premium is going to shrink. A premium is really a reflection of what the exposure is into the marketplace. And so as that becomes, um, uh, as that data is available and as that is something where we recognize there's not a development factor to it, meaning that data is solid and not going to rise upward over time, um, I think you will absolutely see the, the liability reducing and therefore, um, and that's of course, ex uh, related to the exposure and therefore that pie shrinking substantially. Um, but we also see a shift. Like who, who's going to bear the brunt of that expense um, of the insurance policy? If I look in mobility, you've got today, you've got um, enterprises, organizations, platform companies buying insurance policies. You've got um, individual personal um, insurance policies in place. Sometimes those work hand in glove if you're thinking about like a delivery company. Um, or a rideshare business or car share, those policies work hand in glove. Um, and then you have um, other insurance policies in play for whatever that uh, network is impacting. So um, imagine a, a, a transportation network company or a rideshare company, you've got kind of driver, rider, platform, now you've got autonomous vehicle technology, you got a lot in the mix there. As soon as you start scaling some of those um, uh, uh, portions back. So now you don't have a driver, that person doesn't need a personal lines auto policy anymore. Okay, let's peel that back. When you start to peel those back, you're going to shrink that pie. And I think you will see um, auto liability and the insurance associated with, with that scaling down substantially over time. Yeah, it's, it's in my opinion, it's going to be a huge insurance industry disruptor. And, um, you know, I think all of the segments um, of the insurance industry, those, those insuring commercial businesses, um, as well as personal lines insurers, which, you know, you can't, you know, you can't watch the television for more than 10 minutes before you see a, an, a personal automobile ad, which I will miss greatly when, when they are uh, ultimately uh, obsolete. Um, there, um, you know, it's been lots of studies done, but, you know, there's forecasts of um, by 2050, up to 40% of the whole insurance industry's premium going away if autonomy does its job. And um, that, that, that's what I think is such, uh, a, you know, a unique aspect of, of this is usually when we bring a new risk into the world, um, you know, like cyber or, you know, I'll pick on, on Jillian's clients on scooters, for example, you know, usually you kind of say, wow, that really raises the the, the risk profile or the index uh, of, of the world from a safety standpoint. And, you know, when, you, when you're talking about autonomy, the only reason we're talking about it here today is it's because it's intended to reduce losses and save lives. And so if it does what it's going to do, it'll, it'll substantially disrupt the insurance industry that will have to look, you know, at, at other areas to, to um, offset that decline. Jillian, is it hard uh, in the early days when you uh, had a client that approached it, okay, we have a scooter startup and we need insurance. Was that difficult to go through that process originally? Um, in certain ways, sure, but in other ways, not as much. I mean, I think if, if you've got the right process in place for solving emerging risk issues, um, we just have to work the process. Right, so it doesn't mean that it's not difficult to do, but we always know at the beginning that it's doable. So when we look at those risk issues, we we really look at it as kind of a design thinking process where we start with our clients and say, okay, what are we trying to solve for from a business strategy perspective? Um, what do you need as a business in order to accomplish your goals? Don't don't tell me you need a general liability policy or an auto policy that does X, Y, and Z. Tell me what you're trying to do with it. And then tell me where you're trying to go with it so that we know if you're going to be only in the United States, that's one solution. If you're going to be really, truly global um, across all continents, that's a different solution, right? So give me what you're trying to do, and then um, we can come back and design something. When we approach an insurance company with that type of perspective and say, we fully understand the risk issues here. Here's what they are. Here's the data set that we can build for you and how you can think about underwriting it, which is how we approach our clients. 
Um, we also engage actuaries very early in the process. Um, again, we're talking about what I call deep data instead of that long data. So how can we help our underwriters see the data in a new business model like micromobility or scooters? Um, and so they know how to underwrite this new piece. We're all learning. Um, and year two is going to be much easier than year one for all of us. Um, but let's, let's get a workable, flexible program that meets the business needs of the client, um, also meets any kind of regulation that's in place today or that we can see kind of coming down the pipe um, and put that in place for them. And then know, and I, I, if any of my clients are watching this, they've heard me say this a hundred times, which is know that whatever version one is, we're going to have a version two, three, and four, probably within two or three years, right? Because we're going to learn, the carrier is going to learn, our client's going to pivot, their scope or scale is going to change, and we're going to adapt the policies to what their needs are. Um, so I won't say that the first one is the perfect one, but the first one is going to get done exactly what you need to do at that time with an eye toward where you're growing um, in the next couple of years. So you're, you're, yeah, you're a startup's I'll, I'll best friend. That. We try to be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll add to that on, on the insurer side. Um, it's been um, a positive feeling, you know, with that same as, as Jillian and I do our jobs and represent kind of innovation within Aon. Um, most of the major insurers have innovation departments and they're sitting poised to try to solve new problems as well. Um, and so um, that's been, you know, that's been refreshing. And I think everybody's had to um, turn it up a notch uh, over the last few years to kind of keep up with the uh, with the pace of kind of again this this new risk uh, profile of, of the world, and and it's also causing you know kind of back to my earlier answer about the disruption in the insurance industry is we're seeing typically we've got um, life insurers in one camp and personal lines insurers in another camp and commercial insurers in a third. And now those three camps are all looking for where the, you know, where, where's this all going and, and where's, where's my future. So we've had conversations and uh, working in collaboration with our um, reinsurance uh, team, um, looking and talking to personal lines insurers for the first time in my career about commercial risks and, and, uh, and the overlap uh, of, you know, that, mo that mobility and autonomy are bringing. Um, another example might be, um, should we be solving, if in the future, most people won't own their own car, they'll be using mobility um, services, um, and which will include access to autonomous vehicles that might be too expensive for them to purchase on their own. What type of insurance does the consumer need to, rep to, to protect them from what used to be called auto liability insurance? And uh, so everybody's interested in that. And, and is there, you know, we're, is there a solution set out there for every, every consumer to continue to be protected and control their own, you know, protection and their own insurance, as opposed to, you know, just think of last time you got into a, a taxi or an Uber, you know, did you think, you know, gee, I wonder what insurance they've got to protect me in that, you know, I think more consumers are going to start to be thinking about that. That's a, a, a really valid point. Before I want to dive into that, uh, but I want to ask you this question first that came in, Mike, from Austin B. He says, with the tremendous amount of data that autonomous vehicles are collecting, are the insurers in the space well positioned to use this data for ratings and pricing? We had that question just this week. We, we, we had some interviews with um, insurers and I'd, I'd say right now, ultimately, absolutely. Um, initially, um, I think there's quite a bit of work to be done to, to be able to um, have the technology, technology just to uh, decipher the information and to make it usable in an underwriting model. That's one thing. The second thing would be clearing away um, the access to that information and all of the uh, who owns the data, you know, back to back to the polling question, you know, who's got a stake in that and, uh, you know, uh, what's uh, how easy will that access be. Um, and so I think there's going to be probably a cottage industry of, um, of technical startups that will uh, try to optimize that process. Uh, some insurers will try to do it themselves, but I got a sense that there'll be another, you know, cottage industry that will be 
um, positioning themselves in, in, in the middle of that to try to solve for that problem. I think but there will be, I mean, I, I specifically asked the question, Sergeant, uh, is, um, you know, will you at some point in time be able to um, develop a separate rate for autonomous system A versus B versus C from brand name companies, just like we we have different rates for different human driving. Will there be rating or will all autonomous systems be uh, treated the same? And, and the answer was no. We hope to be able to uh, dig into the detail and be able to um, rate the best performers. Joanne, sorry. Yeah, no, that, that leads right into my comment actually, which is, you know, I think of it kind of the 80-20 rule. It, although we do have a lot of data around any point of transaction, I wouldn't weigh all of the data equally. So there are certain data points that we know that are um, better predictors of exposure than others. And so we need to figure out what those are in an autonomous world. So I think that's part of where the insurance industry is evolving right now is we can still capture the, the same data points we used to have. We can also capture hundreds, if not thousands or more kind of data points that are new or we didn't used to have access to, but which are the ones that are really good indicators and should be used for underwriting um, in order to create new policies going forward or to create the pricing around that. And I think that's what uh, part of what underwriters are trying to figure out. It's not that they're slow to adopt and it's not that they're not technologically advanced. Many of them have incredibly um, advanced processes. And in fact, I saw the launch of uh, one of the um, largest global carriers just launched a new digital uh, practice this week. I was so excited to see this happening um, and not surprised, but they've still got to figure out what we've had the opportunity in auto to learn over a hundred years, which is what are the factors that affect um, rating or pricing risk exposure um, and how do we utilize those in, in um, kind of new age tools, if you will, um, as we go forward. I, I do think we've got the, the ability now um, kind of back to what I was saying earlier about creating more flexible policies, I think carriers are now kind of tuned into, um, it's okay to have a policy that's flexible. It doesn't have to be um, identical on day one as it is on day 365. Um, let's have something that flexes for both the carrier's protection and for the, the client's protection. So I think there's some really interesting pieces around the data here. Um, the other comment I would make is, you know, we're asking a lot of insurance companies right now. We're asking them to get smart on data across so many different forms of new types of emerging businesses and transactions, right? Whether, you know, in my world, there's um, platform marketplaces and you're asking carriers to be really smart in platform marketplaces or shared economy businesses. And then we're also asking them to get really smart in autonomous vehicles and what's happening there. And the way that our industry has gotten um, intelligence on these businesses historically um, is through lots and lots of historical data and seeing what that data does over time, right? There's, there is value to data at a point in time, but there's also value in the insurance industry to what happens to the data over a period of time. So if you had a, a claim that occurred, you know, three years ago, and was originally thought to be a call it a $1,000 claim, did that stay a $1,000 claim if we look back on it now? Or did that grow into a claim that was $5,000 because of some kind of complication? Those are things that we learn that that's what we call development. That development is something that, that you know, you, you can only fit one year of history into one year. Um, and so we'll learn that development over time. And I think we've got to, got to give the insurance industry um, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of grace period, if you will, to figure out what's happening with these new losses with autonomous vehicles and other kinds of emerging mobility products to say, um, we knew what it looked like three years ago on day one. Um, how interesting is it today that it is the same? Or how interesting is it today that it's 100 times, right? And, and why? And let's learn from the why on, on either side, whether it's growing or staying the same, and then underwrite to that as we move forward. Meanwhile, of course, the risk has changed over three years. Right, so it isn't. We have better autonomous technology than we did three years ago. We have better scooters today than we did three years ago. So now we've got to lay that data on top. So it, it's it's a it's a tall order for the insurance industry. We've got a wonderful question here uh, from Ben. He wants to know: as risk changed, at some point, does the insurance industry introduce a consumer mobility insurance? So if you're riding on a scooter or a micro mobility or in an AV or a rideshare that you can buy a policy for injury or if you lose something, is that something 
uh, that we're going to see possibly emerge? Your life liability policy. That's what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. It's um, policies like that are um, versions of that are available in other parts of the world. Um, not they're not here in the United States yet. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that we look at in the future. Our, our biggest hurdle to producing something like that today isn't a lack of understanding of the risk or even a desire for it on either the carrier side or the broker side. Um, but these are highly regulated products. How, in, how auto insurance works at the point of a claim, um, we could talk about that until we all fell asleep. So, um, and, and then beyond. So I think we've got to be, there's kind of that, what do we want to accomplish? And then what's realistic given the laws that are in place? Part of what we think about on our team and, and, um, and Mike's team and our kind of combined uh, uh, mobility team is, you know, what's doable today that's useful? What do we need to be thinking about um, for maybe a year out for our clients um, and clients include consumers? And then, you know, what, do, what might we have a heavy uh, government affairs or public affairs lift in order to get done, but is really relevant for, uh, again, consumers or um, our commercial entities and how do we work toward that? And we, and we are looking toward portable, what we call portable solutions um, over a longer range. It's not going to be tomorrow, but yeah, I think that is something that we can look forward to. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, there's a small niche in the insurance industry called business travel accident, and that concept will be buying that for every day of the year, right, for, yeah. for wherever you are. So. Yeah. I'd like to put up our, our last polling question, number four. What form of autonomous vehicle applications will be the first to commercialize? And Mike, that's a segue uh, into this question from Frederick C. for you. From an insurance point of view, what are some of the unique considerations for commercial vehicles, i.e. fleets versus personal use cars? as both markets become increasingly connected and automated. Sure, yeah, and, and um, we're, so we're working with AV developers that um, initially decided to, initially we're planning on a private passenger application um, and have shifted over to say, hey, we might as well, we, you know, we should be looking at, at, at um, trucking as well and that it's, um, you know, might be easier to commercialize um, in that space. Um, so I think some of the big differences, certainly from a liability perspective, is are there humans in the vehicle or not? You know, um, you know, boxes of cargo uh, can be replaced, and human lives cannot. So that that you know, that's that's the biggest factor um, in there. Um, and um, so I think there's you know, I think there's a uh, that's a challenge for us is that there is a big um, array of risks that that could be. Um, thrown into an AV application, uh, even uh, a ride hailing, for example, you know, typically is one or two, you know, one and a half passengers is really the average uh, um, per ride. And, um, you know, a more extreme risk would be a community shuttle, you know, on a college campus or in a, in a um, retirement community or something where you're putting 10 people in a, in one vehicle uh, at one time, you know, simulating like a, um, a, a city bus. That's, you know, that's um, from a liability perspective that, you know, that's going to be by far the, the larger risk. Um, yeah. I see that my, my trick question worked uh, that really the first industry uh, to commercialize autonomy was the mining industry. And that's been, they've been using autonomous vehicles in Australia mines for 10 years now that are driving completely autonomously uh, on a closed track. And uh, it's been, it's been a good, uh, um, a good seed uh, body of experience for the industry to start to learn from. I, th I think the other factor that's interesting with it is, um, so Mike got you on mining. He, I think you got me too, Mike. I wouldn't have got <laughs> mine either. Um, but one of the ones that wasn't part of the question, uh, we've got long haul trucking. I, I think if I, so it's not up right now, but I think 65% of people said that. The other piece that's very relevant right now is delivery. So, um, and that's escalated quite a bit with COVID-19 and the impact of individuals um, overnight having a demand for delivery goods to their home where there was definitely a discussion, no question, a discussion in um, platform delivery companies around how do we deliver goods, whether it's pizzas, groceries, you know, small commodities, um, you know, convenience store items, et cetera. How do we deliver those in an autonomous way 
Um, and you may remember not that long ago, there was kind of an already in place autonomous delivery of pizzas, which unfortunately failed because none of us wanted to leave our home to walk to the edge of the sidewalk where the delivery bot would be. Um, and so that didn't work out, but it was, it was certainly possible. Um, but with COVID-19, there's been a, a real focus on this that wasn't there before in an investment saying, um, we like contactless delivery, right? Where we hadn't really thought about that as much in the past. Um, we also see delivery of all the goods I mentioned previously rising at a five times rate over eight weeks during COVID. And, and I just, I believe, again, this is one of those, the pie is now expanded. Right, so there's a lot of people that are are using these services that hadn't used them before. It's not just the former early adopters who are using it more often. Now it's become pervasive, and so you know I really think we're going to see much more autonomous delivery. Some of that might be via drones. Mm -hmm. um, you see some of the marketplaces heavily investing in drones for smaller items in particular, um, and others are going to be. Um, for other types of items, I, I think one of our hurdles there isn't going to be insurance, it's going to be culture, right? And it's going to be what does it feel like to have these um, uh, kind of robot oriented vehicles in our environment. I, I'm remembering an article that I recently read um, about a, a, an environment, a, a community that was using um, Amazon had tested delivery of goods there. And the reason that people didn't like the delivery drones was the sound. And so, you know, it isn't that they didn't work well. It isn't that it wasn't efficient. People kind of thought it was cool and it was certainly effective, but it was loud and it was pervasive. And so that didn't work. And so I think, you know, in each of these adaptations and adoptions, um, we look to the, to the insurance implications. We've got to grow up quickly as an insurance industry when we see some of these growing, at, again, five times. Um, how do we meet the companies where they are and help to make these these products more available. So I, I, I see autonomous, again, definitely in trucking, but I, I think a, a close second is going to be delivery. Sure. Yeah. And the business model for trucking is, you know, is very clear cut. And, you know, that's such a old traditional industry and to extract the, the cost of the, the labor force out of that makes complete, you know, makes complete sense on, on paper. Um, on the private passenger side, though, it's, it's interesting because I think what um, both ride hailing companies and autonomous ride hailing companies, what they're competing against is our personal cost per mile of our transportation today. And I think a lot of people don't know what that is in, in your own life. You know, if you, if you add it up, you know, your cost of vehicles and fuel and insurance and other uh, parking and divided that by your number of miles you drive in a year, you know, you get a number. My, you know, mine's like 74 cents or something like that. But not, not a lot of people do that math to understand that um, so that when they look at an alternative, whether, you know, whether that's a, an autonomous rideshare vehicle and what it's going to cost per mile, you know, then you can, you can make a, an educated decision on what, what works best for you. Um, so I think more consumers are, that's going to be more top of mind and, and figuring out over the next few years is what is their personal cost per mile. You know, and I, I like to thank you and Jillian and, and Mike for this insightful, awesome conversation. And we can go on for, for days and days, but as we, we look to wrap up this conversation, I like each of you to, to share uh, your thoughts and opinions on how do we ensure the future of mobility and then what's going to happen when a, a mobility company becomes big enough that it decides to go into the public market. Does Aon help them make that journey from private company uh, to public company? And Julie, uh, we'll start with you, please. Sure. Um, we have. We've helped a number of companies um, make that journey. If you think of some of the largest mobility as a service um, companies, both in ride share, um, as I mentioned before, car share, uh, micro mobility, platform delivery, um, we saw some very prominent names. Um, take that uh, private to public journey over the last couple of years. And I think um, if we're reading the papers closely, we might see that, uh, that a few more are gonna make it in the next six months or so. So um, many of those have done that on our watch and we're, we're just thrilled to be a part of that, um, of that growth. And so I think, you know, it really goes back to the, to me, the cornerstone of all of this from an insurance perspective is data. Um, we often see in the mobility space, our clients as they're growing, um, hiring actuaries even before they hire risk managers, hiring trust and safety teams before they hire risk managers. Not saying risk managers aren't important. I think they're critical. Um, but what I'm sharing is that, you know, that attention to detail and capturing data to inform 
the future insurance transaction is paramount to the success of these businesses. And when you're looking at the cost, and if you do um, look at some of these publicly traded companies that cost is then exposed and you can see it, um, what you'll see is it's a tremendous um, expense to many of these businesses to have um, appropriate insurance that both meets their exposure, but also just meets their um, regulatory liability, meets what's required by law. Um, and so we're there to help and create what's most efficient, um, but the best way to do that is to, to capture appropriate data and build long-term relationships, not, not just with your broker, but um, certainly with insurance companies, particularly with emerging business models. Um, insurance carriers are, are absolutely underwriting to that deep data, but they are also underwriting to your risk management practices, the culture of risk that you bring forward, um, and your business model and plan. So they, they are underwriting the people and processes as much as they're underwriting the data. Uh, and you've got to bring both in a credible way to the marketplace. Mike, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that not from a uh, private to public perspective, but from a startup to a maturity, a full maturity perspective is what I think I'm enjoying the most in working with our clients. And I think that Aon uh, gets the best, I'm sorry, our clients get the best of Aon. And uh, when we look at, you know, today, if we're just solving for wh wh which most companies are right now, just testing uh, of autonomous vehicles, um, which, you know, we, we've, our industry's figured that out um, o over the last few years, um, but projecting that out to their ultimate application and their ultimate business model. And that's where Jillian and I've been able to pull from across all of Aon into our trucking practice and, um, and others that, to, that, that bring us um, knowledge about how these, how these businesses that we're not necessarily familiar with, I've learned a lot about the trucking industry in the last six months, um, you know, what they need to survive and how this new technology is going to impact uh, their risk profile. And being able to deliver that whole spectrum to a client, I think, is very rewarding for us and, and for our clients to, to take, you know, to, to have the vision for them and help them plan for the future. And as we've heard on this SAE Live, relationships and, and data are key to ensuring the future mobility and Aon can help you navigate the risks in the market. So thank you to Mike and thank you to Jillian for taking time out of your day to share everything with us and all of your incredible insight. And to our attendees, if you've enjoyed this, please subscribe to the SAE Tomorrow Today podcast on your favorite podcast platform to hear more depth uh, conversation. So thanks to our wonderful panelists and to uh, everybody for attending. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon. This is not a typical crisis event. The COVID-19 pandemic is driven by unknown factors and hidden interconnectivities. In an increasingly complex and volatile business environment, informed decision-making has never been more important. To help companies successfully navigate the COVID-19 crisis, Aon has developed a comprehensive crisis response framework. It's built around three key tools, the Black Swan Decision Framework, pandemic crisis management model, and a set of business impact actions and priorities. The Black Swan Decision Framework helps business leaders build a resilient mindset, while the pandemic crisis management model for COVID-19 focuses on building structure and flexibility into decision-making. Check out the other videos in this series to find out more. These tools will become vital as the C-suite considers its business impact priorities we have identified five business priorities that are top of mind for C-suite executives. First, the challenges of COVID-19 mean that protecting people and assets is becoming a major imperative for executives. This will involve mobilizing various departments, from IT and human resources to risk and finance. Second, CFOs in particular are focused on financial metrics, cost reduction, increasing revenue, and free cash flow, all connected to the company balance sheet. For example, to ensure an organization is making the right decisions regarding its financial health, teams across an organization will be involved in assessing liquidity as well as fully understanding and analyzing risks. COVID-19 has caused many companies' revenues to dry up. Now is the time for business leaders to identify strategies that help maintain or increase revenue and be able to pivot business models and serve customers in new ways. 
In just a short time, we've seen the devastating impact of COVID-19 and the daunting challenges everyone has had to face. Leaders of organizations should focus on using Aon's COVID-19 response framework to help them make decisions that put their firms on the path to resilience and success. I really think it's important and when I heard that this opportunity was available, I jumped right on the bandwagon. Yeah, well, I'll volunteer, I'll, I'll help out. Um, I think the STEM field's really, really, really important to help kids understand that, hey look, science and math is really, really cool, check this out. And I think we just need people to get them excited about that. I like Jetway because it's a cool experience and I actually feel like an engineer. SAE, this, this event that they put on for us is, is amazing, this opportunity that we definitely would not get if SAE wasn't sponsoring it. And making all these rules to give us a real world design challenge to really put us into a real world opportunity to show on our resume and get good jobs in the future. I have been involved with Formula SAE since I was a student in 1991-1992. This is my 20th year as a volunteer. I consider education as a lifelong experience. Even after you graduate, to have opportunity for uh, continuing education. SAE offers a lot of continuing education, and I think that's all sort of part of that education value that SAE provides. Being a member of SAE, I've had experience and exposure to a lot of different areas. Um, through the publications that SAE sends out, I can get a lot of exposure to different nuances in the industry and in neighboring industries and through the online education through SAE I've been able to get a lot of training in areas that I may not otherwise get to experience and that has just helped broaden the range of my knowledge base and help really help me grow as an engineer. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this SAE live conversation. The information and opinions are for general information only. Further, SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this episode.